magic at its best is even impossible in that situation. That for it truly to be magic, uh, a magical moment, it, it has to be spontaneous. It has to be something that just happens not in a stage show that's carefully plotted from beginning to end, but rather in a moment. Probably the, the most famous of those stories is about Molini. That's what made his reputation, doing impromptu pieces. He would sit down in a restaurant at a meal, and he would be at the table for a long time, a number of hours. He never got up during the course of the meal, and eventually he would borrow a woman's hat, and then he would get a coin and he would spin it, and he would say, lady or eagle. He would never say heads or tails. He would spin it and cover it with the hat. And when he lifted the hat, if the woman said lady, it would be the sign that had the woman on it. If someone said eagle, he'd spin the coin again, and when he lifted the hat a second time, there would be the picture of the eagle on the face of the coin. And then he would do this a third time. He would spin the coin, and when he lifted the hat, there was no coin at all, but in fact, an enormous block of ice. So it was 1995, and I'd come on an assignment from The Guardian. I'd heard that the BBC was making a film about this very extraordinary close-up magician, and I came to write an article about him. I came in after the BBC had already started, and basically it was very clear the minute I arrived that, that, that it was not going well, and that Ricky and the director in particular uh, didn't get on very well. And essentially, the problem was the director was on at Ricky, as I remember it, to produce um, a particular effect. He wanted a centerpiece for his film. And the more he demanded it, the more Ricky resisted. The tension built and built and built to the point where the BBC and Ricky were really barely talking. In the middle of all of, of, all of this, I think as a break, we went out to the Huntingdon Library to try and take the tension out of it. He seemed to be altogether in a much better mood on this day. I mean, we all noticed that. And Ricky said to me, come on, suddenly. He said, come on, let's go and have lunch, which was quite unexpected because He's quite, a you know, he can be quite cantankerous, Ricky. I mean, I think he'd admit it himself. He can be quite difficult. And um, so he said, get in the car, Susie. We're, we're going to uh, Sunset Boulevard. We're going to have a lunch together, and we'll do the interview. I got in the car. It was me and Ricky in the car. I, we started chatting, preparing, you know, the interview that we were going to do. And we took the wrong turning off the uh, freeway. And so then we had to find our way back on. And so a journey that maybe should have taken an hour or something from Pasadena, I'm not sure how long it's supposed to take, uh, took double. And it was fantastically hot on this day. And I couldn't help noticing, even at the time, I thought, gosh, he's taking this all very well, you know, for such a sort of irascible man. You know? And um, so then we got to the restaurant and it was the worst possible place for an interview. It was full at lunchtime. It had glass on two sides from floor to ceiling. First, there was a 20-minute wait for the table. And then we sat down at a table. Ricky was opposite me, and he was chatting away, and he started to talk about the tension there'd been with the B BBC and saying, you know, I think that he regretted that this had happened and how he very much wanted to do this set piece that Paul had particularly asked for that had been performed by a 19th century magician, Max Molini, at a dinner party. And he started to tell me the story of Molini at the dinner party, the hat, the dollar, and so on. And as he was, as he was telling me this story, I think I became aware at that moment that he had his menu open in front of him. So he was partly concealed behind this rather tall menu. And as he was telling the story, he said, and Molini lifts up the hat. At that moment, he lifted up his menu. And on the table in front of me, I think, I'll never forget it. I mean, on the table in front of me was this huge block of ice. I mean, it was about a foot square. Really, I can't exaggerate. Huge block of ice that you, later when I picked it up, you know, held with two, two arms. I remember I burst into tears, and I think that shocked him a bit, actually. 
because it was such a kind of uh, violent reaction. You know, I just sobbed. And, um, and he said, I mean, he can be very gentle, Ricky, in fact, for all that he growls a lot. And I remember he said, I deceived you, it's what I do for a living in this world. But, um, you know, he also, I mean, it's a moment I'll never have again. You know, I'll, I'll never forget it. I mean, it was a kind of supreme piece of artistry that I witnessed that was done for me. I mean, that's what it felt like at the time. He had produced this extraordinary effect for me. I think I realized in that moment that this was, you know, what we'd all been waiting for in a sense. I remember looking under the table, you know, there was no water on the floor. The sun was pouring in through these huge windows on two sides and the ice cube was melting in front of me. I mean, visibly melting so fast that I knew, you know, the ice cube could only have been on the table seconds before I saw it. It was the most extraordinary thing I've ever seen in my life. You think he does?